Okay, welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to day two of the virtual annual meeting of the Western Regional Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species. Uh, my name is Chris Shani. I'm with the California State Lands Commission's Marine Invasive Species Program, and I'm also the chair of the Coastal Committee within the Western Regional Panel. And we have a really great session laid up for you today on coastal issues. I'm very excited about it. Um, you can see on the bottom, we have, we'll have talks from Aaron Gray from Governor State University, Amanda Dorghini from Alaska Center for Conservation Science, Josie Icarella from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Kim Fuller from the State of Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources. But before we jump into the presentations, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about our coastal committee uh, within the Western Regional Panel and some of the work that we've been doing, and hopefully recruit a new member or two. So the Coastal Committee is uh, one of the standing committees for the Western Regional Panel. Um, it's a pretty large committee. We have about 40 members and most of us are actively engaged um, throughout the year at the meetings and different priorities. Um, we focus on all aspects of aquatic invasive species management. So that includes prevention, monitoring, detection, eradication, control, containment, outreach and education all within the coastal and tidally influenced waters of the Pacific region. Um, so we put the website for the Coastal Committee there in the middle. If you're interested in learning more about the Coastal Committee, please visit that website. And we have an email address there as well. And if you're interested in joining the Coastal Committee, please send us an email and we'll put you onto the list. And a reminder that you don't need to be a member, an official member of the Western Regional Panel to be a committee member. So everyone's welcome to be on the committee. Um, just want to spend the next few minutes talking about some of the work we've been doing within the committee. And a lot of the work um, over the last couple of years has stemmed from a white paper that we produced in 2017 on biofouling in the US Pacific States and British Columbia. And for anyone who's not familiar with the term, biofouling refers to the organisms that are attached or associated with underwater surfaces and for our case it's surfaces of vessels um, the vessel will move from one region to the next or one marina or port to another and move a whole community of organisms with it um, in this report we looked at four different categories of vessels uh, commercial merchant and passenger vessels so things like a container ship or a cruise ship uh, recreational vessels so things like a sailboat or a yacht motorboat and the marine environment uh, commercial fishing vessels, and then mobile marine infrastructure, which is a broad group that includes a lot of atypical vessels like dredges and construction barges or even mobile drilling rigs um, and other infrastructure that can be moved around like aquaculture equipment and boating docks. So one of the main takeaways from that report was that for commercial merchant and passenger vessels, we know a lot about their movements and where they travel because there are regulatory programs in place to track that for a lot of the dis different jurisdictions. And in many jurisdictions, there already is existing authority, regulatory authority to manage some of those risks. But for the bottom three categories, the recreational vessels, the commercial fishing vessels, and the mobile marine infrastructure, there really wasn't a lot of um, useful like targeted guidance and, and any regulatory authority. So we put a few action items into this report for ourselves to work on to try to fill in some of those gaps. Um, we first tackled recreational vessels. So at last year's annual meeting, um, we just finalized the um, this outreach document that we produced for these recreational vessels that gives a bit of information about why managing biofouling is important to a recreational boater and gives best practices for managing biofouling. Uh, we printed off about two, 3,000 of these rack cards to distribute throughout the region during the boating season, but obviously that had to get put on hold because of the situation we're in now. Um, so our, we have been distributing some of them, but our goal is to get out next boating season and get a lot of this information in the hands of boaters. And it's also available on the Coastal Committee's website. And then at last year's annual meeting in Missoula, uh, the day before we held the Coastal Committee meeting and decided to create two subgroups or subcommittees within the Coastal Committee to work on the other two items. So one for commercial fishing vessels and another for mobile marine infrastructure. 
and both groups have been meeting off and on throughout the year. Um, for the commercial fishing vessel subgroup, we developed a draft um, guidance document that's similar to the recreational boating guidance document, but targeted specifically to commercial fishing vessels. Uh, we had a graphic designer create a mock-up for us, and we sent it out to a lot of external stakeholders to do a practicality review and get some feedback on how realistic it was for us to ask what we're asking the boaters to do. Um, we got some good feedback and we met a few weeks ago to make revisions and we, we hope to, to finalize that sometime relatively soon, take it to our entire coastal committee for input and then to the executive committee um, for final approval, hopefully this year. Within the mobile marine infrastructure subgroup, the approach is a little bit different. So rather than give guidance to the owner or the operator of the mobile marine infrastructure, we wanted to create a tool that can be used by agencies that had permitting authority or leasing authority or project approval authority so that they could uh, require biofouling management of any mobile marine infrastructure that might be used in a project um, as a condition of a lease or a permit or approval. Um, so we created a draft um, of that tool. And again, we sent it out to a handful of agencies at the federal and state level to get some feedback on how practical things were. We received some great feedback and our plan is to use that in the coming months to revise that and then go through the same process of getting the, the entire coastal committee on board and then taking it to the executive committee. Um, the timeline for that is probably later this year, early next year. Uh, so that's essentially what we've been doing over the past year, um, what we will be doing in the coming months. So again, the website is there for the Coastal Committee if you're interested, and um, the email is there. So please send us an email if you have any questions or if you're interested in joining the Coastal Committee. So with that, we're going to kind of transition into the actual presentations today. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're good. The way it's going to work, we're going to have each of the speakers give their presentations in sequence and then have a, a 30 minute question and answer period at the very end. Um, and so we ask the audience to use the, the right hand tool that it's a question mark inside of a chat bubble. So if you click on that, you can ask questions. So we encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the presentations and send them in and indicate which speaker the question is directed to so that at the end of the all four presentations, uh, Mason Parker will facilitate a question and answer period with all four speakers. And so he'll be asking the questions to the speakers that you have sent in. So you can do that at any time during the four, quest the, the four presentations. Um, for the speakers, um, just a reminder that we ask that you put your camera on while you're talking and then off while your presentation is done. And then we'll bring all four of you back on with the cameras uh, for the question and answer period. And then the last bit was yesterday, there was a bit of a technical issue um, for some of the viewers. They weren't able to see some of the presentations. So if you have any issues like that, while you're viewing this, just refresh your browser and that should take care of it. I think that's all we had to do for housekeeping. So we'll move on to Aaron Gray. So I'm gonna switch presenters to you, Aaron. So if you can accept and then turn your camera on, I'll introduce you. So Erin is an associate professor of ecological genetics at Governor State University, and she's soon to be moving to the University of Maine. Her research focuses on the ecology and biodiversity of aquatic and marine ecosystems and integrates fieldwork, big data, and molecular tools to answer basic and applied questions in this area. So Erin's talk will be on eDNA metabarcoding in ports. Uh, with some promises and pitfalls for invasive species management. So, uh, you are. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great, fantastic. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, like Chris says, I'm going to try to move a couple things over here. Um, like Chris mentioned, I'm uh, currently. Uh, Professor at Governor State University. I'll soon be using, moving to the University of Maine. Uh, so I am an academic, um, but I've been involved in biofouling um, research since my PhD, which I did out on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So I'm familiar with the, the West Coast there. 
And uh, I've been involved with the Great Lakes Invasive Species Panel um, uh, for a few years now because I was a postdoc with David Lodge. So that's just sort of my brief story. Um, I want to thank Chris and everybody for um, allowing me to speak about my research. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear uh, uh, what you all think about this potential applications of this research for um, invasive species management. Let me see. Okay, great. Uh, to give you an outline of my talk, I'm, I'm first going to talk just a quick overview of eDNA and then give you an example of um, how we're using a one type of eDNA assay, metabarcoding, to test for um, some, some ecological model, models that are very large in scale and we think relevant for, for policy and management. Um, and then I'm just going to touch on a few final thoughts on eDNA metabar barcoding for management because it's kind of a new technology and some of you might not be familiar with the sort of promises and pitfalls of this uh, particular technology. So to get started with an overview of environmental DNA, it's, it's simply DNA that we collect from water, air, or soil, so from the environment. Um, if we're talking about small organisms, single cell organisms, or, or smaller or smaller multicellular organisms. It can be the whole organism, like for diatoms or bacteria. Uh, but usually uh, for the larger organisms, like this shark I have pictured here on the right, it's we're talking about collecting cells or, or perhaps even DNA that got, got somehow escaped from cells of this shark that got kind of either sloughed off the shark or were excreted or somehow got into the environment. And um, Studying eDNA itself is not that new. Um, this is how microbiologists studying bacteria and fungi, this is oftentimes the only way that they, they can study them is by collecting DNA from the environment. Um, but for macrobiologists, you know, for, for those of us who study lo larger organisms, it wasn't since the study of Physotola et al. in 2007, where we kind of realized, and, and, and they studied frogs, okay, in wetlands. It, it wasn't until that study where we realized, oh yeah, we, we can actually just, just collect this DNA that's been shed in the environment and kind of get an idea of, of who's where. So before you start getting too excited about this method, um, we do know, uh, and, and fairly well established now, that detection of DNA varies quite a bit. Uh, detection rates vary across different taxa um, and across environments. Um, so you can't just apply these assays blindly. You have to understand their their, um, their detection rates in the particular habitat and organism you're working with. Um, we do have a, a couple different types of eDNA assays. Sometimes we're looking for specific species, and these are, are generally very uh, sensitive um, and accurate. And we also have other assays where we're just going to just probe for a bunch of species at once. And these are less sensitive um, and less accurate, but still useful. Despite these drawbacks, it turns out that collecting eDNA is just so much easier, faster, and cheaper um, than lots of other types of sampling, although not, not always, um, but in many cases it is. And this allows us to um, just do surveys over a, a wider space and time scale. So this is game changing for science, uh, both basic and applied science. Um, and I kind of break, break it into two ways. Uh, uh, two areas that eDNA has been able to really kind of um, accelerate, and that's the testing of policy relevant ecological models, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and uh, but also there's some hope, and, and there have been some examples where eDNA uh, surveys can help us detect new species early before they become well established and more difficult to mitigate. So like I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the first one, just give you an example here, but then I'll talk a little bit about new species detection towards the end. So to get started, I just want to introduce the ecological model that, uh, that uh, my collaborators and I set out to test. Um, we wanted to um, see if we could develop a predictive model that could explain the spread of species by ships around the world. Um, so this is a very ambitious project and it involved a lot of collaborators, including geneticists, network scientists, and economists. Um, and you can see my team pictured there and we were funded by an NSF grant. 
Um, and I just give you a diagram here. The whole idea was to, to create a model of shipborne species spread uh, that was informed by ship traffic data, uh, which we now have about loads of uh, climate data, data of the ports across the world and different um, factors of the voyage, right? Like how long the voyage was, things like that, which we know affect whether species survive or not. Um, we were then going to test these model, this model or models with, with um, eDNA metabarcoding data in different ports and, and see if we could kind of uh, predict reality accurately with these models. And then we were hoping to, to use uh, these models to do kind of uh, now casts, like so where, where are we going to expect the next invasive species or next non-indigenous species to pop up and then forecast under different climate trade and policy scenarios. And then, and then this part up here, this really important part of interacting with management and policy and being like, hey, do you guys find these types of models useful? What could we do um, to, um, to make it more useful for you? And not just an academic exercise. So uh, right now I'm just gonna focus on, on this part because I wanna highlight how eDNA can, can be used to test these sort of large ecological models. Um, so, uh, our goal was to predict the spread of species and ships globally, and this is this is hard um, because it's a complex problem. First, we have an extremely large and dense dense network of of ports and ships ship shipping voyages that connect those ports. Um, here's a, a a picture of um, I think this is just cargo transport work um, along the coast from our collaborator Jim Corbett from Delaware. And we're working with a data set of <clears throat> over 5,000 ports, 50,000 ships, and 1.5 million voyages per year. This is, comes from Lloyd's, which is an insurance company. Um, and we have six years of data between 1997 and 2018. So this is one of those big data projects you always hear about. Um, and, and secondly, uh, we are, uh, so we have this large, dense, complex network. And, and so we're not sure what the best way to measure kind of spread risk uh, between two ports. So I'm gonna now focus your attention on how do we measure spread between two ports? And you can think about it um, a lot of different ways. And we kind of broke it down to four ways because we just had to kind of start simple. Um, but the first way is just, okay, we'll just say the number of voyages, let's say between point A and B is sort of relative, is predictive of the risk of species spread between these ports, right? Um, and then between B and C, maybe we have fewer voyages, so fewer risks. Um, however, um, if, you, if, if you're really kind of thinking about how these species are spread through the network, you understand that it's by ballast uh, water or biofouling. So we're just gonna think about ballast water for now. Um, and we know, we know, you know, there's, there's um, more ballast on certain types of, sh of ships. So maybe not all ships are equal in terms of the amount of ballast water they're carrying. Um, we also know that some voyages are longer, so species don't survive in ballast as well. And then also some ships just don't exchange ballast water as frequency, frequently as other ships. And so we can put that into kind of what I'm gonna call a ballast risk estimate based on you know, the, the actual types of ships <clears throat> that are making the voyages between point, port A and B. And that might be different than just the number of voyages. Um, and then, so we have these kind of direct pairwise estimates of risk, but then we can also think of um, sort of network level phenomena. Uh, we like to term, term stepping stone risk. And so this is the idea. So maybe port A, there's no ships that go directly between port A and port C. But port A and C are connected because we could have a species that gets dropped off in port B, picked up by another ship, and then taken to port C. Okay, and we can think about those stepping stone kind of interactions or, or risks, um, both in, the, in a network created by a number of voyages or in a network based on ballast spread risk. And so what we did is we said, okay, we have these four options. Which one is ex which one explains uh, the biodiversity patterns we see between ports the best? <clears throat> and um, how we set about to test this, um, and, and this is really amazing because as a person that was like actually, you know, studying biofouling in ports, 
Um, you know, I did four sites in my for my PhD, and it was like full time job. Um, with eDNA, we were able to sample over 20 ports around the world, and this, of course, was with help from a lot of port sampling volunteers and and you know Chris and and the the uh, uh, coastal committee. Um, you guys, I had several volunteers uh, through through this panel, so thank you very much. Um, so we were able to basically ship out sampling kits and um, instructions and have people go out and sample all these ports around the world. And sometimes I went out myself. Here, here I am with Jim Corbett in Delaware. I'm actually originally from Delaware, so this was a fun trip for me. Um, and, and it's really simple. You just scoop some water and you're going to filter the DNA out and then you send it back to our lab. And um, what our lab is going to do okay is um, we are going to extract the dna and if you want the details it's in the right panel there and then what we decided to do and this is after a lot of um, testing preliminary testing is we decided to use one of these general primers uh, that's targeting the 18s gene and just know that it's going to get a lot of different types of species that's why we chose it um, and then we sequenced it and what we're going to end up with is not species per se rather um, sets of unique sequences we call amplified sequence variants or ASVs. Okay, so there's a little bit of fuzziness going from ASVs to species, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so yeah, 21 ports, and that's not, I mean, there's over 5,000 ports in the world, but still when you think about 21 ports gives us 210 port pairs, right? So that's that's a lot of estimates of like how connected these biological communities are. And what did we get when we did the sequencing? Well, across all of our ports, we detected over 17,000 um, ASVs, so unique sequences. And a lot of them we couldn't identify, but some of them we could, or we feel pretty confident that we could. And um, we were able to um, um, look at known non-indigenous species from the WORMS uh, data set. And we found 152 known non-indigenous species and 31 harmful algal species. So that's pretty good, um, especially for a group of people that don't know how to identify algae. <laughs> we just did that with DNA. Um, and of course, right, some of these species we can identify pretty easily, uh, or most of us um, that are familiar with these habitats, like the, the mussels and the tunicates, but but others like the diatoms and the, and the copepods, I mean, um, uh, DNA is really useful in these situations. Um, because we don't have enough taxonomists in the world. So um, those are just some of the, the species we found, but we, for this particular study, we were more interested in, remember, testing about, okay, is it number of voyages? Is it ballast risk? Is it some stepping stone risk? Um, we wanted to know which one of our models, if any of them, were right. Um, so our hypothesis going into this was that shipborne species spread so one of those risks is going to homogenize bi biodiversity between ports um, because you feel like if port A and B have a lot of ships going back and forth between them, their biological community should be pretty similar. Um, uh, but we also know that there's some covariates in this situation. For example, we know that ports that are in the same ecoregion that are close to each other should also have very similar bi biodiversity just because they're um, because of biogeography. It's not invasive species at all. They're just close to each other. So we had a, a, a covariate we had we called ecoregion in there, um, whether ports A and B were in the same ecoregion. We also had a covariate called environmental dissimilarity. So how or dissimilar were the ports, right? Um, obviously, going from marine to freshwater is going to be hard for anything to live, no matter how many times they get introduced between the two. And the final, the final factor in our model was this risk mes re metric. And we did four different models, right? Because we had four different potential risk metrics. And we did backward selection to kind of reduce these models um, of these singular factors and all two interactions to just keep the ones that were important. And then we ranked them. Um, and I'm not going to go into the, the statistics of it. Just know in this particular ranking, the lower the number, the better. Um, and what we found was that the risk variable, so that risk metric, was in all top models, which is great. So, so we can pick out a shipping signal, even in this global data set. And we also see, if you can see up here, the AICs, the top two ranked models were both included stepping stones. Um, and actually the, the model with just the number of voyages and considering stepping stone risk between the ports 
um, did the best, um, although they were all pretty similar. One last interesting thing that we found is in the final models, we always got a significant um, shipping risk by environment interaction, and this makes sense. Um, and what I'm showing you here, um, I'll just talk about it really quickly, is just that we found when ports were, were more similar, okay, so they had lower dissimilarity here on the left, um, we found that increased shipping, which here is the um, higher increase, uh, purple represents high shipping, um, and, and, and orange represents low shipping. Um, uh, when ports were in similar environments, um, shipping really did have an effect, okay? Um, so in similar ports, lots of shipping between them, very, uh, it was homo shipping homogenizes diversity there. However, when um, ports are become very environmentally dissimilar, so these two on the right, um, shipping had little effect on that. So suggesting that the environment really is filtering out a lot of these potentially invasive species. So that was really neat um, that that popped out. So what can we conclude from this is just basically that um, um, ship-related species risk spread matters. Um, and, and this is really showing this at a global scale, but at a pretty fine resolution between 21 ports. Um, and this means this is good for all of you guys because managing this risk is going to reduce biological homogenization. So, um, so your work is really important. Um, the second interesting thing was that stepping stone metrics um, were, were more explanatory than, than the pairwise metrics. Um, and this suggests that we need to take a sort of network approach to um, uh, managing um, the spread risk. So maybe we focus on clusters of interconnected ports, not just identify specific routes between which there's a lot of shipping. Um, we also, in network science, and, and I'll go into this just a little bit, um, there's a way to kind of target these hub ports for management and monitoring. And it might be more efficient use of our time to, to target them to break this spread because they're like the stepping stone ports. Um, of course, environmental similarity was the most important factor. Um, so we want to focus on environmentally similar ports, uh, port pairs uh, for potential spread. And we also have to think about climate change and how that's going to affect uh, port environmental similarity among ports. And finally, um, and this just kind of popped out a little bit surprisingly, we expected ecoregion to be in the final models, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't that explanatory. Um, and, and, you know, I thought about this a while too, because I, like I said, I did my PhD in ports, but it just might be that ports are just such novel habitats um, that these evolutionary and biogeographic fa factors that we think are a lot of important in um, biodiversity is just not important in ports just because they're kind of dirty and lots of anthropogenic uh, habitat. But we still need further research. Um, we still, yeah, there, we, we don't have quite enough data to, to officially say that eco region doesn't matter yet. So more ports needed. Um, here's just an example, and I'm, I'm going to go through this uh, super quickly, of uh, network-based risk management. Um, and you can see these papers here. I'm just putting you, them up there for ideas. You know, uh, Jian uh, was a grad student who just uh, ranked these kind of hub ports um, using a ba very basic clustering method. And, and the ones that you expect to pop out, Gibraltar, Singapore, Panama Canal, things like that. Um, and uh, we have another grad student uh, working on some more like higher level network science stuff to try to um, uh, cluster these ports even better to get a good idea of these indirect interactions between ports. Um, and here she just applied it to um, ports in the Arctic. Um, and that paper should be coming out soon. It's in the last stages of review. Um, I'd like to close out with just a kind of um, some final thoughts on, on using eDNA meta barcoding. Um, so um, the, the process is right, basically, I'm just showing you here in this figure, is, is you collect these cells from the water, um, whether they're whole organisms or, or just parts of organisms, you extract the DNA. And for meta barcoding, uh, most methods now are going to do what they call this PCR reaction, where we're going to target specific genes like CO1 or RBCL, or I just showed you our study used 18S. And it's important to know, and this is here, that the PCR is not going to work on every single one of those cells. So we're going to miss some things. Um, and then also, 
um, when we now have those sequences and we go to match them to species, um, if we don't have a reference library for that species or a reference sequence for that species, we don't, we're not going to be able to identify it, right? So there's lots of uh, fuzziness in this metabarcoding data. And the real promises in my, in, in my view are that we can, it's, and I've done some, some uh, ground truthing of this, is that we have really robust, we can get really robust beta diversity estimates um, so we can compare diversity between sites or between time points really well with eDNA. We know that it's very accurate in that state. What we can't do is really, for a lot of things, accurately identify species, um, but we can sometimes do it. Um, and this helps. And, and as soon as, if we get more and more reference sequences, which we are, that's growing, we'll be able to identify more and more things. And so you'll be able to just sort of cast a blind net and see maybe what's in your port, even if you weren't looking for something specific. So that's a benefit. Um, and of course, it's easier, cheaper, and more taxonomically broad than um, traditional sampling. But like I said, the pitfalls are many species still aren't sequenced, so we don't know them. Um, if you're looking for specific species, you're better off to divide, design a species-specific assay. And uh, we can still get false positives and false negatives um, for, for a lot of the reasons I just discussed above. So my recommendations for eDNA metabarcoding is that um, you use it to test big ecological models, like I just, I just showed you we did for our big NISRAPS model, um, and for maybe an early warning AIS monitoring where you're gonna try to just cast a broad net and be like, okay, what might be coming into this port? Um, if you do find something weird that's coming in, like let's say you find a crab you didn't expect, I would suggest going back to your DNA samples and actually um, testing it with a species-specific assay, um, just to be sure. Um, and last but not least, um, we really need more taxonomists because um, if you just have sequences, it's, it's hard to say anything. We need people that can put a name to that sequence and a function to it um, so that we can better understand what's going on here. Um, and with that, again, I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborators. Sorry, I went a little, a uh, couple minutes over. Um, and uh, the NSF Coastal Seas, Illinois LSAMP grants, so undergrads, and um, you know over two dozen port sampling volunteers. A lot of you, uh, a lot of them involved with this panel, um, and also Chris um, for for being so helpful. Um, he's like an honorary member of our group now, um, and that's all that I have. Thank you, Aaron. That was great. Um, just a reminder to keep the questions coming. If you have any for Aaron, we'll get to them at the very end of the session. Um, we're going to move on. So I'm going to change presenter to Amanda. Um, so Amanda, if you are able, can you accept and then share your screen and turn your camera on? Um, okay, I should be sharing my screen. Um, we can see, you just can see the talk. Okay, see my little notepad, awesome. And then my webcam, let me see. Okay, sweet. <laughs> okay. okay, well, let me introduce real quick. So Amanda is a wildlife ecology ecologist at the Alaska Center for Conservation Science, where she conducts research on animals adaptations to Northern and Alpine ecosystems. She received a MS from the University of Alberta and a BS from McGill University. And her talk is titled An Invasive Species Risk Assessment for Bering Sea. So take it away, Amanda. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Let me put that on. Okay, that should work. Okay, sweet. I'm a little frazzled because I'm operating on Alaska time and thought it and didn't realize the time zone. So I'm two hours behind, but here I am. Um, and like Chris said, I'll be talking about a risk assessment that we conducted maybe two years ago now, just looking at what the risks are for non-native species to um, survive and establish in the Bering Sea. So I'm sure uh, this is familiar to many of you when we're talking about non-native species in marine systems, most of the introductions are unintentional and they're largely transported by 
vessels. So whether it's ballast water or in the picture at the top, fouling organisms such as barnacles, which attach themselves to wetted surfaces and then get transported. I also included a picture of a float plane here because sometimes the ways um, by which species get transported um, are things that we wouldn't have thought of. So in Alaska, we hear a lot about Elodia being transported in uh, lakes and in freshwater systems um, by float planes. Um, these non-native species, um, obviously, as we know, can have severe impacts on the economy, the environment, and the human and human health. And I've just included some pictures of the worst offenders, um, and this can include animals, um, but also bacteria, such as the bacteria that is responsible for cholera, which has been, which can be transported uh, through ballast water. When we talk about introductions in the Arctic. Um, although this reality is changing a little bit, there actually haven't been that many introductions that have been reported, and especially not um, in the Pacific. There's a few hypotheses as to why that might be. Some, uh, some scientists have asked uh, whether the photo periods, the extreme light regime that we experience in polar systems might be responsible. Uh, minimal shipping traffic, of course, so that a pathway is uh, is not present in many cases or is very minimal and and cold water temperatures which is um, what we were looking at in one of our components of our risk analysis as we know conditions in the arctic are rapidly changing so we can see the bering sea here in the center this was a picture taken in 2013 you can see the extent of the sea ice about you know halfway down the bering sea um, at, its, at its longest extent. And then in 2018, five years later, um, that, that um, sea ice has practically disappeared for, for the same day. Obviously, there is still some in the, in the winter. Um, as, a, as a result of this, um, people have, have been talking about uh, the opening of the Northwest Passage and other sea routes um, and the Bering Sea is where uh, ships will be either entering or exiting. In addition to its you know, geographic importance, when we're talking about shipping routes, the Bering Sea is also one of the most um, highly productive marine ecosystems in the world. It supports a billion dollar fishery, which in the US is uh, either first or second in terms of how much money it brings in uh, every year. Um, and in addition to that, there's so many coastal villages that are um, and, and island communities in the Bering Sea uh, that rely on uh, not only the Bering Sea's resources, but also um, as rely on the Bering Sea for, for their identity and their culture. As far as we know, uh, there haven't been that many uh, non-native species that have been found in the Bering Sea. Um, of, of the four that I've shown here that have been reported, only two of them, uh, Maya arenaria, the softshell clam, and Caprello mudica, the Japanese skeleton shrimp, are known to um, have established populations here. Uh, finally, the Bering Sea is a major hub for um, vessels of all kinds that are transiting um, and doing business in the in the Bering Sea. We conducted a risk assessment to try to understand uh, what non-native species we should be concerned about and where we should be looking for them. And so there were three components to our risk assessments, um, and I'll be walking through uh, each each one of them, um, just giving a brief overview. So for the first one, uh, the invasives, the invasiveness ranking system that we uh, developed and applied. So we uh, developed a ranking system comprised of 33 questions across uh, five different categories. And for each species that we were concerned with, we conducted a literature review and assessed their invasiveness potential by answering these questions. So. Um, the assessment results in a report and a final invasiveness score that can range from zero, meaning low invasion potential and low impact, to 100, high potential, high impact. 
and we evaluated 46 species, which we chose based on their proximity to the Bering Sea. Um, and 21 of our reports and scores were reviewed by experts. Just quickly showing a couple of descriptive results, but um, our scores ranged from 29 to 74. On the low end of the scale were uh, small marine plankton that are low on the on, on trophic levels. And then at the high end of the scale, of course, our favorite European green crab, as well as mussels and oysters, all of which have um, large impacts on the ecosystems that they inhabit. This is just a screenshot of what um, the first page of our report looks like. So if you are interested in the scores or in the information included in those reports, they're available on our website. And although a few questions are specific to the Bering Sea, this could easily be adapted to other systems of interest as well. Our second component was an environmental suitability model. So we were interested in of the non-native species that we assess, which ones can actually survive here and can they establish populations here? So we use data that we had collected during our literature review. Uh, these were data on species physiological tolerances to water temperature and salinity. And we considered two life stages uh, or biological processes. So adult survival, and then also if information were available, um, reproduction or early life stages to get at this establishment component. And we compared these tolerances to conditions of the Bering Sea as predicted by regional ocean models. So these models have been developed by NOAA's uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, and we applied them um, to, to our models, uh, to our environmental suitability models. And we considered two 10-year time periods, so what we called recent from 2003 to 2012, and then future from 2030 to 2039. This is just one of the results that, that we have. So this is a um, composite map averaged across the uh, across several um, several of the models that were produced. And the colors in in red, I'm sorry that this might not be colorblind friendly, but the colors in uh, in red are um, show where larger numbers of species are able to survive in the Bering Sea. And the cooler colors represent where fewer species are able to survive. So this is kind of the sum of all of these species specific models that we ran. And so um, what we, in this, this slide that I'm showing here is looking at year-round survival. So does the species have suitable temperature and salinity conditions for 52 weeks out of the year? And if yes, then it's considered to uh, be able to survive in that particular pixel of the Bering Sea. So as we can see here, we have high suitability along the chain of the Aleutian Islands, as well as um, along the Western Alaska Peninsula, and uh, in, in parts of Bristol Bay. And obviously, as we get further north, as, as we get into that region of sea ice, um, then we have very few species that are predicted to be able to survive here. And um, I didn't mention it, but the black line is um, the average maximum sea ice extent over, over two decades. And as we fast forward to our future predictions from 2030 to 2039, um, we end up getting this northward shift that is that is predicted. So increasing suitability, more species being able to live um, in areas that were already suitable, and then a general northward northward shift. We didn't consider, as you, as you can probably notice, we didn't consider bathymetry, um, although that's obviously important uh, and something that we could do in uh, in future iterations. Um, although we did restrict our modeling um, to the continental shelf. So um, areas less than 200 meters deep. And uh, we did this for establishment potential as well. So taking into account this reproduction or early life stages, if, you, if you're interested, 
we did publish our results this year. Um, and if you send me, an, send me an email, I'd be happy to uh, provide the PDF for anyone who doesn't have access to, uh, to the journal. Our final component of risk assessment was just looking at shipping traffic patterns. So where are um, na non-native species most likely to arrive? So in this, uh, in this graph, we looked at commercial vessels um, and we use publicly available ballast water discharge reports to figure out, okay, of the boats that are discharging ballast water in ports of the Bering Sea, where are these boats coming from? And so this is a circle plot. It's a little confusing at first, but uh, it's actually quite easy to read. So the dashed line, above the dashed line are all of the ports in the Bering Sea and below the dashed lines are all of the contributors. So the states or countries where the boats are coming from. And the most obvious thing that you see uh, is this huge arc of Dutch Harbor. So out of 816 trips, um, from taken from commercial vessels that discharged ballast water, uh, 756. So uh, I think close to 93% uh, ended up in Dutch Harbor. So this is not surprising given uh, how, how important Dutch Harbor is as a port in the Bering Sea, um, but it's still striking to see it this way. And when we look at where the ships are coming from, we see that the Gulf of Alaska in, in blue at the bottom is, is contributing, um, but in fact, the majority of the, of the vessels are, are coming from, uh, from outside the state of Alaska. So we have large contributions from, from Washington and from California um, and also from South Korea. We used data on uh, fishing vessels uh, that are required to send to, to give their location. So this is not publicly available data, but we wanted to look at um, fishing vessels uh, and, and what the patterns were like for those. And so again, Dutch Harbor receiving the lion's share of the traffic, but also nearby Accutan, which is only 30, 30 miles away and is where the Trident Seafoods processing plant is. So lots of back and forth. Uh, between those two. Um, so Accutan and Dutch Harbor are receiving the lion's share of that traffic. And when it comes to fishing vessels, the contributors are actually a lot more regional. So Gulf of Alaska representing about two thirds of that incoming traffic, and then Washington, Oregon, and Southeast Alaska showing up and nothing, um, nothing from outside of, of that. And the importance of that uh, of that work is uh, when it's when you overlay the the ports with our uh, uh, environmental suitability models, you see that Dutch Harbor and Accutan are right in the crosshairs of where we uh, where where we predict that the most suitable conditions environmental conditions are for non-native species. Just a few uh, additional closing conclusions. We know that conditions in the Bering Sea are changing rapidly. And we also know that non-native species of high concern are occurring in nearby regions. So as many of you have probably heard, the European green crab just showing up in Haida Gwaii. That's you know, at our doorstep in Alaska and um, certainly moving northward rapidly. Based on our environmental suitability models, um, many species appear to have the potential to survive year round, but there's still this un, unanswered question from our, from our work about what is the role of reproduction in potentially limiting establishment of population. So in some cases, we found that water temperatures were never high enough um, currently and in the future for, for some species to reproduce. And in other cases, it seemed like the length of time um, during which conditions remain suitable might be the limiting factor. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge a whole suite of people, Tracy Gotthard, who was uh, instrumental in um, obtaining this, this grant by the North Pacific Research Board and in developing the ranking system. And many of, of, of the people listed here helped review our reports and ensure that the scores that we uh, came up with made sense given what we know about the species.
Again, if you are interested in, in this information, can you just visit our visit our website or uh, contact me or ask a question and I'd be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Very cool, Amanda. Thank you. And nice job with the last minute scramble. You wasn't obvious at all. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move to Josie Icarella. So I'm going to switch friends for control. Um, Hi. Hello. Oh, perfect. Okay, so Josie's a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Victoria, British Columbia. And for the last three years, I studied vectors of marine invasive species spread along the BC coast with a focus on potential risk of invasions in marine conservation areas. Josie's PhD work was on the context dependency of aquatic invasive species predatory and competitive impacts in the St. Lawrence River, Quebec, and in Ireland. Uh, so the talk title of Josie's talk is Invasion Risk in British Columbia uh, Marine Conservation Heritage. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I'm just trying to see if this panel's in the way of my presentation. Can you tell me it? Are you able to just see my full presentation? Yes, perfect. It looks good. I'm just going to move this in my way. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing with Fisheries and Oceans Canada over the last couple of years on marine invasion risk in British Columbia. So I'm going to start by talking about the global prevalence of invasions in MPAs to give you a context of this issue, and then zoom into British Columbia to look at invasion risk from boating vectors and environmental suitability. And then I'm gonna uh, shift gears a bit to talk about maritime structures as a vector of spread. And so uh, you'll notice that the last three talks all um, feed in really great uh, into what I'm gonna be presenting. So that was a nice, uh, nice beginning. Okay, so I focus a lot on marine protected areas because this is a, a really important uh, focus for the government of Canada and other governments internationally. Uh, so MPAs have become a focal conservation tool for protecting biodiversity worldwide. Uh, as you can see on the right, the graph uh, light blue line uh, shows that MPA extents have uh, greatly increased over the last two decades and uh, Canada has now met our um, mandate to protect 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020. And we're now looking uh, towards post-2020 protecting uh, up to 30% of our marine areas by 2030, and then even more beyond that. However, uh, these protection measures are really only effective if we are able to mitigate Dressers within the spatial balance of MPAs. And so that's where the invasive species issue comes in, as we know that invasive species are very prevalent and they can have very high impacts on our native species and ecosystems. So to understand the magnitude of this issue, we first asked what is the prevalence of invasions in MPAs globally? Uh, so this topic is not uh, published on to a very great extent. So we decided to address this question by conducting online questionnaires targeting MPA practitioners and researchers. Uh, so we had uh, 151 responses from our questionnaire uh, representing 47 countries and territories and 116 MPAs. And uh, from these MPAs, 73 reported a known presence of invasive species. Uh, the map on the right, the top, indicates the number of survey responses uh, for marine protected areas on this questionnaire, and that ranges uh, from orange to red. Uh, it's one response to up to nine. Um, and then the same for number of non-native species identified below. Um, so in terms of the number of non-native species, that's a very low number. We weren't asking for exhaustive uh, inventories for the MPAs, rather uh, we were looking for um, species that the practitioners could identify as being present, um, and then also that uh, they could answer further questions about. So we asked questions 
about um, non-native species impacts and MPAs, their impact type, their abundance, and their invasion pathway. Um, so these are uh, categorized by taxonomic group. We have plants and algae, sessile and mobile invertebrates and fishes um, in the bars. So on the top left, um, so there are uh, invasive species that are currently having high or severe impacts in MPAs uh, across taxonomic groups. And these impact types on the top right, you can see are generally negative effects on native species and also change to habitat structure or complexity. Uh, current abundance ranges from low to high across taxonomic groups, and the invasion pathway is often spread from other areas, uh, also noted as ballast water and hull fouling, and for fishes, uh, the aquarium trade. Uh, so these results basically just show that this is a, a prevalent issue, and there are uh, a number of case studies already where uh, non-native species are uh, deterring the conservation goals of MPAs based on their um, high um, diversity within MPAs, and then also the impacts that they're having. So we wanted to address this specifically for British Columbia um, by looking at first how vessels link invaded areas to MPAs. So it's a similar view of ship traffic uh, that the other presenters took, but a more um, fine-tuned and uh, localized approach. So. Uh, we used automatic identification system uh, vessel tracking data uh, for 2016. So we had 8,000 vessels tracked within our study area. And so uh, looking specifically at vessels that moved from an invaded area into an MPA, uh, we found that recreational vessels were uh, the most dominant in this data set. So almost 800 vessels um, from recreational vessels made these connections, um, followed by fishing and tug. The map on the right in, uh, just shows you our invaded areas. Um, so this came from aggregating our site observa observations of where non-native species are occurring. Uh, and then we use the top 80th percentile of uh, non-native species richness to identify our uh, invaded areas of interest. Um, and so this ranges from seven to 59 non-native species, with the highest uh, being aggregated around Victoria and Vancouver. So we used uh, graph theory and network analysis uh, concepts to uh, get metrics of how these vessels are connecting our areas of interest. So invaded areas are in red, MPAs are in black. And I just have an example here on the left of a, sh a vessel moving um, in and amongst these areas in the uh, dashed purple line. And so these vessels hop in, into and out, up, hop in and out of these areas as they move. And each time they transit um, from an invaded area to an MPA, that creates a connection that in graph theory is termed an edge. And so our, our areas of interest are termed graph nodes, and we can look at how these connections are made. Um, in the middle panel, it just shows that we um, looked at the actual ship uh, or vessel track to determine the amount of time that the vessel spent within these areas. And so then we came up with three different metrics um, of these vessel pathways. So we have the, the duration within the areas, the number of nodes that are connected, so that's invaded areas connected to MPAs, and the number of edges, um, so that's the number of times that these areas are repeatedly connected. And just very briefly on the right, this is an example of what it actually looks like in GIS. So we have hourly track data in the points, and then we interpolate this uh, on, along a gridded coastline to get these um, routes of connections. So overall results, the map on the left indicates vessel uh, densities along the coastline. And the map on the right shows uh, pathways by uh, density and uh, our, also our invaded areas, MPAs, and then uh, MPAs that specifically overlap invaded areas in gold. So 58 of the 83 MPAs, or 70%, had vessel connections with invaded areas from our vessels. Um, and 24 of the MPAs, almost 30%, spatially overlapped invaded areas. So that's uh, not even considering um, vector connections. Uh, using the duration of time that the vessel 
spent within these areas, we identified the top five highest risk invaded areas and the top five most at risk MPAs. We used duration as a, a first step proxy for risk based on the idea that the more time a vessel spends in an invaded area, the more propagules it can pick up and the more time it spends in an MPA, the more it can release those propagules. And so the boxes on the right map indicate um, those top five areas. And you can see they're generally congregated around uh, southern BC. Uh, so in looking more at duration the best of the vessels in these areas, uh, vessels spent up to 200 days in invaded areas. And this is because a lot of uh, invaded areas will uh, overlap with marinas and docks. Um, whereas in MPAs, they may spend up to 50 days at a time. Uh, vessel categories uh, were divided to look at which vessels were creating the most risk. And we also divided by season. So uh, this is the idea that there's more propagules in the water and, then, and therefore more risk during warm season uh, movements. Uh, so looking at some of the metrics, the recreational vessels definitely pop out as um, creating the most connections in terms of the number of vessels that are within these areas and also the number of invaded areas that they're connecting to MPA. And this is particularly true um, in warm seasons when recreational vessels are more active. Um, conversely, tug boats are the ones that are hopping between these areas uh, the most frequently. So moving on to um, environmental suitability. So we clearly see that there's a lot of connections between these areas. So there's a lot of potential for introduction. We then wanted to know what is the likelihood that these uh, non-native species can establish in our MPAs. And so we did this for eight modeled species uh, using species distribution models under current and future climate conditions. I'll just note that our future climate conditions are a bit uh, further down the road. So an average condition uh, that was modeled for 2041 to 2070. And we selected species that are currently present along our coastline and also are expected to have high impacts. So we have the four uh, representative tunicates, the green crab, uh, the oyster drill snail, um, caprella shrimp, and sargassum seaweed. So I'm just going to show you uh, the one main graph uh, from this project. Um, it's a bit complicated, so I'll walk you through it first. So the top two panels are current conditions. The middle two panels are future conditions, and the bottom is the change from current conditions to future conditions. Uh, each column represents an MPA. Uh, so that's going along the columns, and then the uh, MPAs are organized by uh, bioregions with Strait of Georgia, Southern Shelf, and Northern Shelf. Uh, the bars are richness across the eight modeled species. So you can see that under both current and future conditions, we have a high level of expected richness in our MPAs. And then the colored matrix shows the probability of occurrence based on environmental suitability, with the dark red being. Uh, very high level of uh, probability of occurrence. And so again, across these species, there's very high environmental suitability, except um, Styella has a slightly lower environmental suitability, especially in the Southern and Northern Shelf. And then um, looking at the bottom panels, uh, in most cases, uh, we see an increase in environmental suitability in future conditions, except for green crab. Um, has some expected uh, lower suitability in the Strait of Georgia from uh, warming temperatures. So overall, under future conditions, environmental suitability for invasive species increases 82% across MPAs and species and uh, is expected to decline only 14%. And the most change is expected for MPAs in the northern shelf. Uh, so very briefly, uh, to summarize those last two projects, 70% of MPAs are connected to invaded areas by vessels, and 30% of MPAs already overlap invaded areas. Six of our modeled invasive species of eight also reached a greater than 90% predicted occurrence across MPAs under future conditions. 
so we see both a, a very high risk for both uh, introduction potential and establishment potential. So I'm going to uh, really shift gears here. I've been focusing um, so far just on the shipping vector, but as Chris mentioned uh, earlier, <clears throat> maritime structures are also a very important vector that, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> let me take a drink of water. Um, <clears throat> maritime structures are an overlooked vector that can be very important, particularly because these structures will stay in the water on a scale of months to years. And then if they are moved, it's at very slow speeds within water, so generally 10 knots. <clears throat> and then when they are relocated, they stay in the water again uh, on order of, of months to years. And so these have a very high capacity for uh, building up uh, extensive biofouling communities and then um, retain those communities as they move. So this project looked at a couple of different structures that are known to uh, have these kinds of conditions. So floating docks, derelict or ops vessels, buoys, floating lodges, which are quite common for the, our uh, coastline, uh, non self-propelled barges, and then a variety of aquaculture associated gear, including net penaries, rafts, trays, and floats. So of these structures, we generally found uh, four uh, were moved um, more frequently and, and were of more concern um, based on our research. So we found oil platforms, floating docks, floating lodges, and obsolete vessels uh, to be the most uh, dominant uh, source of this vector along our coastline. So they have different characteristic movements. Uh, you can see uh, some case study examples that we were able to find um, for these structures. So oil platforms um, are shown in purple. Um, there's a couple examples of oil platforms that are set up in Puget Sound. Um, they're stationed there for um, a few months while they're set up and then they're towed up the, close, up the coast to Southeast Alaska where they're operated and then towed back down uh, when they're done. Um, obsolete vessels in blue, uh, have the opposite pattern. So you can also see that the obsolete vessels being moved around in the, the close-up of the Salish Sea as well. And so smaller vessels may get towed very short distances to be brought onto land, um, but very large ships that are decommissioned um, get in some cases towed all the way to Mexico uh, to be brought onto land for destruction. Floating lodges have um, more of a within coastal movements uh, or within our BC coastline movement. Uh, they, uh, in some cases, will overwinter in Vancouver. So oftentimes they operate around Haida Gwaii and the north uh, coast of BC, and then they'll uh, be towed back and forth uh, for their seasonal uh, wintering. So that is shown in green. And then uh, finally, floating docks are shown in the dark red um, in the inset uh, blown up map. Um, so those are very small movements. They may be done more frequently because they are generally initiated by the public when they're selling, say, their personal at home um, floating pontoon, for example. Um, they may sell that dock and then uh, tow it to uh, another location. And so those movements, uh, we have a few uh, examples of around Victoria. Um, however, it's it's incredibly challenging even figuring out um, where and when these movements are being conducted as they're not um, regulated and they're not recorded. Um, I also, in this map, just show the standing stock of floating lodges along the coast in the, the small uh, green circles and then dock area, which is uh, predominantly concentrated in the Salish Sea. And this also just um, provides uh, standing structure for biofouling of non-indigenous species. Um, so we looked at the actual biofouling communities on some example docks uh, before and after they were towed to see um, how much uh, of the community is retained during these towing movements. So three of these docks were towed uh, independently by the community, and one dock was towed uh, by ourselves as an, uh, an experimental example to look at um, what actually falls off during the towing. So in the top graph, uh, you can see that before and after tow, the biofouling percent cover remains almost 
identical, so there's very little um, loss of biofouling. And then uh, looking at the community structure in the NMDS plot on the bottom left, um, again, the, the community structure is quite similar before and after towing, so a lot is retained. Uh, and then on the bottom right panel, this is our experimentally towed dock where we attached a camera to look at what actually does fall off during towing. And so we observed this for the first two hours. Um, and generally, we did find that um, some muscle clumps would fall off, uh, particularly within the first half an hour, also some sponges, uh, eelgrass, and rockweed. So this pre presents two um, points of, of potential spread. There's both the fact that the entire, almost the entire community is being moved to a new location uh, where propagules can disperse, um, but also as the structure is towed, there is some seeding of propagules along the way. Um, so we developed a preliminary framework for how uh, we might want to try to manage this vector. And it's basically uh, just going through a series of questions to determine how risky uh, the uh, structure is in terms of, of how it's being used. And so um, if the structure is moved during its lifespan, we ask, uh, will it be relocated within the same bay or will it be stationed in freshwater, in which case we don't see it as a very high risk. Um, but if it is moved to a new location in water, uh, we ask, is it feasible uh, to take it out of the water? And if it is, then that will be the ideal scenario where it can be power washed or air dried on land prior to replacement in water. However, this is um, very uncommon as oftentimes these structures are very large. Uh, so in most cases, we would recommend um, a variety of possible in-water uh, cleaning actions, though, um, of course, these have a gradient of efficacies and costs associated with them. Uh, so this is uh, currently a, a, a massive vector that's, that's not um, a focal point for uh, managers because it's it's not very frequent, but when it does happen, we believe that it, it can be a source of a large number of propagules. So I'd like to thank the many people that contributed to this work and DFO for funding. Uh, all of this work is published uh, and open access online. So um, I highly encourage you to uh, look there if you want to see more of the methods and results. Um, and also you can feel free to contact me and I can um, send you the links to those papers. So thank you all for listening. Thanks, Jesse. Um, a lot of really cool overlap with the stuff that we're doing in the coastal committee. So just a nice chat afterward. Um, we're going to move next to Kim Fuller. Um, shift it over to you. Let me know if it works if you're able to talk. You are. Hello. Just pull up my screen. While you're doing that, I'll, I'll introduce you. So Kim has worked in the Aquatic Invasive Species Program at the Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources since 2016, and she currently serves as the aquatic biologist specializing in early detection, rapid response, and control. And the talk of Kim's talk is exploring innovative control options for the Caribbean port through anemone, a novel introduction to Hawaii. Okay, great. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Okay, great. So hello, um, I'm going to talk to you today about exploring innovative control options for the Caribbean corkscrew anemone, Bartholomea annulata, um, which is actually a novel introduction for Hawaii. So I work in the Aquatic Invasive Species Program for the state of Hawaii um, under the Division of the Aquatic Resources. You can see some of my team right here. Currently, we're a team of six. At full capacity, we're a team of 10, um, but unfortunately due to COVID, we'll probably remain at that uh, not completely full level for a while. So like many of your programs, we deal with invasive species through one, prevention. So a lot of those ballast water and biofouling talks before managing those things, um, early detection and rapid response, as well as management and control of established introduced species. So Hawaii has been called the invasive species capital of the world. We have 463 marine species. Um, that includes both introduced and cryptogenic species, uh, inverts, fish, and algae. 
we have 86 freshwater introduced species, um, and that's a total of about 550 introduced and cryptogenic aquatic species for just the small state of Hawaii. Um, being an island chain, we depend on daily shipments. Um, and you can see up here in the right hand corner, um, this is an example of invasive algae. That's actually what our team primarily deals with managing on a day to day basis. We use um, manual removal paired with native urchin biocontrol to try to uh, help the coral reefs recover from the invasion of algae. But we also deal with any aquatic habitat necessary. So we may um, try to monitor and control invasives on coral reefs in the intertidal, in estuaries, streams and lake, as well as ankyline pools. Um, so we have special ankyline pools on, primarily on the big island, uh, so Hawaii Island. But today I'm gonna be talking to you about a rapid response and then attempted control of a new introduced anemone, uh, the Caribbean corkscrew anemone. So we received a report in January 9th, 2019 from Kyoki Sedner. He actually is a wildlife expert. Um, he has a great website for species identification in Hawaii. Um, it was found in the area adjacent to Heia Small Boat Harbor. So that's on the east side of Oahu. Six days after the report, we did a site inspection. Uh, we took photographs, we collected live specimen, and we got a taxonomic confirmation. We reached out to our colleagues who have uh, more knowledge of species identification uh, to verify the identification of the species. So in the field, um, it's actually a quite difficult cryptic species to identify. It's not larger than one centimeter, although literature has said that it can grow to larger than 12 inches of diameter. Um, it's similar to native species. So you can see our native species on the right there, that's Aptasia, and then the one in the middle is the Annulata. So it looks quite similar. Um, it can grow under the undersides of rubble and also can just kind of protrude from algae. So you can see on the left, and side of the screen, these tiny tentacles, that's uh, what we were looking for when we we're looking for the species. So we did an initial distribution survey. Uh, we spread our surveyors about 10 meters apart and collect GPS points at 10 meter intervals um, to kind of make a grid pattern so we can get good coverage of the area. We recorded the density of the anemones within one meter. Um, so we just counted the anemones for this and made bins for our data collection. We then analyzed the data in ArcGIS uh, interpolation. So you can see the density of the B. annulata distribution um, in the area. We also were concurrently doing a literature review to understand the risk of invasion of this new incident. Um, so we looked at habitat and distribution, ecology, feeding, life history, reproduction, impact elsewhere in the world, um, so invasiveness elsewhere, and management options of similar species. So we found that it was native and common in the Western Atlantic, Florida, and Caribbean, up to 40 meters in depth. It's a popular ornamental aquarium trade species. Um, it feeds on zooplankton, macroinvertebrates, and is able to grow and shrink throughout the lifetime. So the size is not indicative of the age of the organism. It has a short lifespan, but high recruitment, and it can reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, so asexually, if you're trying to say scrub it, it can actually reproduce through repeated laceration. So that would not be an optimal control technique for this species. Um, it was described as a weedy species, but has shown no history of invasion. And we also reviewed similar management um, and treatment options. So this was indeed a novel introduction to Hawaii. It's the first time it was reported in 2019. And we ended up doing further distribution surveys. So you can see um, the purple is the areas where the annulata is present. The blue is the outline of the area that we surveyed. So we surveyed almost two kilometers squared in total. Um, the anemone was present in 0.21 kilometers squared. So approximately 11% of the area was covered in this B. annulata. 
We initially started with the density, so the um, you could get a better idea of the community density, but due to the large area that we needed to survey, we switched to presence absence because we were more concerned with the extent of the distribution. We did determine what we feel is the northern ex extent of the anemone distribution, but the southern edge, we had to jump around, um, and we do not feel that we necessarily determined the southern extent of the distribution. We also found that there could be spread without connection. So we surveyed patch reefs. Um, these channels in between the patch reefs are about 40 feet on average in depth. So, um, you know, consistent with the literature review, it can jump across habitats. And we initially thought that the Bianulata was only found in silty, sandy, rubble areas, but we did find it growing in between coral, which could be a concern. Um, currently, it's more of a cryptic growing species. So if you were thinking about what it could compete with, it would be native anemones and zoanthids. Um, but there have been examples of when drivers change that a cryptic species can become invasive. We redid the uh, 2020 distribution surveys. Um, so the initial surveys were in 2019 and we just uh, redid them this August. Um, we just were more concerned about the Northern extent. So that's all we uh, really surveyed. And you can see the 2020 surveys are in yellow and the 2019 surveys are in purple. The distribution is quite similar. Um, so we don't feel that there was significant change in the distribution. And most importantly, there was no evidence of northern spread. So we followed a rapid response protocol in the state of Hawaii. Um, we have a lot of species here that are invasive here, that are invasive nowhere else in the world. For example, mangroves, which are you know pretty much endangered habitats in other areas are considered invasive in Hawaii. So we have to um, look at every new introduction as a potential threat. So with each report, whether that comes from the community, uh, we also encourage them to use iNaturalist or this program called Eyes of the Reef where the community members can report the status of the health of the reef as well as invasives. Um, we will follow up usually with the site inspection concurrently with the literature review. Uh, look at the distribution because the footprint is really going to tell us a story of how established it is. Um, and then we either attempt a management action or resurvey if we feel that it's necessary. During the literature review for this species, uh, we came across work from Terry Work at the United States Geological Survey um, with his partners at the US Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Nature Conservancy. They were dealing with an invasive coralomorph at Palmyra Atoll. So this coralomorph is actually a native species, but um, certain drivers, something changed in the drivers causing the habitat to shift from a stony coral habitat to uh, this invasive coralomorph smothering all the coral. Um, and even you can see right here, a uh, clam as well, Pyridacnia. So we reached out to Terry because um, we had worked with him previously and we found that he had tried multiple control options with his partners out at Palmyra. They've tried bleach with tarps, heat, caustic paste, uh, many, many iterations were tried. So paste with bleach, paste with acid, and then paste with sodium hydroxide. They even tried a laser um, to, they were hoping to semi-automate it uh, to go around and shoot the coral elmorphs. When we reached out to him, um, I was happy to find that he was looking to scale up two of those control options um, and actually was going to have them shipped to Hawaii before Palmyra. So sodium hydroxide paste um, and as well as heat. So we tried these two options on the annulata. The heat treatment uh, was comprised of a custom made heater. So a heater that's actually used to normally send warm water to divers in frigid conditions was altered to be able to heat to 71 degrees Celsius, which uh, Terry and his colleagues had found that was the coralomorph mortality point. Um, it uses salt water in situ, so it's great. You just throw a pump over the side and you can heat up the water um, that's there. And the flow is about 15 gallons per minute. You also need other um, 
you also need other things. So you need a generator and a gas. All of these things were fairly heavy. Uh, so what we had to do was we would trail, we luckily had a mini barge from some of our invasive algae removal projects prior to this. We would trail the mini barge to the site with the equipment and then load the equipment on with a forklift um, and then trail back to the pilot study site. So the site we chose was an area adjacent to Heia Pier where the B. annulata was present. Um, we didn't have a motor for the mini barge, so we just had to manually swim it over. We decided to do four plots ranging in a quarter meter squared to four meters squared. We also set up a temperature logger array to measure adjacent temperature um, because you would think about what's important for coral reef habitats. You wouldn't want to be heating the water because coral bleaching is a predominant problem as we're dealing with climate change. Um, so we wanted to make sure we weren't negatively impacting the environment we're trying to manage. The water had to be heated to 92 degrees Celsius to reach 71 degrees at the outflow. And it was kind of, um, we were doing a lot of adjustments with the heater, trying out different funnel sizes as well. So the results, it took about five minutes per metered squared um, to treat the affected area. No residual heat was detected. And you can see here, I have a graph of the percent mortality um, versus the plot size. And the green is one day post-treatment and the yellow is 15 days post-treatment. So one day post-treatment, the mortality ranged from 33 to 71% with an average of 45% mortality. And 15 days post-treatment, we actually had some regrowth of the anemones. So it was negative 47% to 54%, but that still came out with the average 11% mortality. We also noticed during the treatment that invasive algae was getting bleached with the heat treatment. So we decided to try to treat just invasive algae plots. Uh, invasive algae is one of the main species that we work to control here in Hawaii. So we did two one by one meter plots. We selected a site in Mauna Lua Bay, which is on the southeast side of Oahu. And we did a visual estimation of invasive algae cover. It took about 10 minutes per meter squared to treat. And we got a range of about 69 to 75% mortality. So 72% mortality average. The paste treatment was a biodegradable polymer that was produced uh, for a company, sorry, by a company for the original uh, trials in Palmyra, as well as glycerol, calcium carbonate, and sodium hydroxide. It's negatively buoyant, so uh, you can spread it out on the benthos and it'll stay on the benthos. It's biodegradable and dissolves in less than three days. And this iteration of the paste was chosen because it had the highest success in Palmyra with a 90% elimination of coral morphs in trials. And the equipment needed for this also large um, industrial equipment. So an industrial mixer where they pre-mixed the paste uh, off of the water for the day of, a shovel pump and a compressor. We chose the same area in Kanyahe Bay for the heat as we did for the heat trials. And we did six plots, a quarter meter squared to four meters squared. Again, it was a exploratory process. We had some attachment clogging and we're figuring out the best way to apply the paste. Um, Terry and his colleagues had already fabricated uh, different nozzles to try out. So for this paste treatment, it took about almost six minutes per meter squared. The mortality ranged from 60% to about 91%, with an average of 82% mortality. The four meter squared plot was not completed um, because the paste had run out. Again, we had to pre-mix the paste offsite. Um, so we just only could treat with what we had, but it still had a, a mortality rate of 50%. So we found these two treatments did have a variable mortality rate. There's multiple factors that could have contributed to this. B. annulata lives on the underside of rocks. You can see this is a piece of rubble turned over. So if you were to look at it in the field, you would only just see the edges of the tentacles peeking out from under the rock. We didn't flip over any of the rocks during treatment. Um, so that could have affected the treatment accessing this organism. The paste was more successful or B. annulata than heat, and the heat treatment was more successful on invasive algae than on B. annulata. 
visibility was a confounding factor. Um, these habitats that we're looking at for especially B. annulata are just silty, sandy. With the heater, um, the water flow would just cause plumes of uh, silt to, to be kicked up. So visibility also could have been a constraining factor in correctly applying the treatment to the species. It also took about a minimum of five minutes per meter squared for treatment. Um, so with the 207,000 meters squared of Bianulata that we found, um, that would require 431 40 hour work weeks. And because the impact of Bianulata is unclear, we saw no obvious impact um, and there was some incidental mortality. So invertebrates uh, were killed by the treatments. We will probably not move forward with using these treatments for this species but it's a larger picture of what this experience was. This gear is ready to go to Palmyra. Uh, we improved the heat and pace setup and methodology. And the Coralomorph at Palmyra is obviously more impactful than the Caribbean corkscrew in Kaneohe Bay. We assisted in expanding the potential AIS toolbox. So when Terry and his colleagues at Palmyra did the PACE, I think that was the largest PACE trial that has ever been done in a marine setting. And um, Marine settings are incredibly challenging to control invasives. So it's amazing that it could be scaled up and workable in marine settings and potentially if you had the dedicated resources over large areas. So I just want to acknowledge all of our colleagues and partners who assisted us with these trials as well as the distribution surveys. And I just wanted to touch really quickly on something that can be achieved. So this year we found three species of non-native coral. It was reported initially by uh, Hi'ilea Cavello of the Cavello Ohana. So they're a native Hawaiian Ohana. Um, the corals only took up about three by three meters and we were able to do a removal completely in two days. We will need to follow up because uh, there was some fragmentation but, um, you know, if you can remove a threat in just two days where the impact is clear, you can see up here on the right hand side, this green polyped coral is non-native and this bottom orange coral is native. We did see it growing over native species, as well as some of these colonies were adjacent to endemic corals only found in Hawaii. Um, so because we could decidedly say that the impact was significant and the footprint was small enough, we could successfully take action on this. So when we're thinking about what management actions are possible, we're going to think about distribution, the footprint, um, impact to the environment, the economy and community. If the community is impacted, they're more likely to support action. Um, sometimes it can be hard to get community members behind, say, using, you know, poison or things like that. But if they're behind it, um, we're more likely to take action as well. And it also is dependent on the available control action. Do you have the manpower, the technology and the funding to take action? Um, so here are my contact information. You can email me and um, also visit our website to see about more, more about what we do for aquatic invasive species. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. I guess we will uh, move on to our Q&A now. Um, if uh, all of the presenters could uh, just pull up their webcams for me, please. All right, uh, yeah, so we've received a, a, a number of questions here. Um, uh, we'll, we'll hop around just so everybody gets a little bit of time to speak and a little bit uh, we can cover all of the subjects here. Um, we will start out with you, Aaron. Uh, this question is from Christine Moffat. Um, regarding the sampling at ports, what time of year uh, for multiple samples were used in the sample design? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so because we were relying on volunteers, we made sampling as easy as possible. Um, 
so it was just surface grabs from the docks or jetty, uh, whatever people could do. Um, we chose five samples. Um, we we took more, but but we thought that that in order to stand standardize across all ports, and then we um, it was usually summertime. Um, but we did have the requirement that uh, usually summertime high slack tide. Um, we did have the requirement that there was no rain within 12 hours because that can dilute the surface DNA. And that was just too difficult in like some places like Alaska. <laughs> so they had to wait until like September or October when there was a, a, a good, good enough sampling day. So yeah, so we tried to standardize as best as possible, but it's still not perfect. Good question. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one is for Amanda. Uh, of the higher risk species you identified, how many would be detected by existing NIS monitoring systems in Alaska? From Thomas Thurl. Oh, you're muted there. Still not hearing you. Someone unmuted me. <laughs> I was muted by the organizer. <laughs> um, um, well, uh, yeah, that, that, I think that points to an unfortunate reality that we have in Alaska with um, very little monitoring being done, as far as I'm concerned, in the Bering Sea. Um, there have been some monitoring in Dutch Harbor by Cirque, especially, but it tends to be inconsistent, I think, and just prone to uh, funding cycles. Um, it would be great if we could have, you know, if we could leverage the power of these coastal communities and have uh, some monitoring, consistent monitoring to find these species. But I think right now we probably wouldn't know until someone reports it, you know, walking along their dock or sees something unusual. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Josie. Um, what management options are being considered regarding visitation to MPAs? Are there considerations of exclusion zones from Christine Moffitt? That's a really good question. Um, no, I would say there's so that we have some ecological, we have, I think, one or two ecological reserves where it's, there's uh, full exclusion. Um, but for most of our MPAs, there are, uh, there's no regulation of the traffic that comes in and out. And so really, and that's really hard to do. So and especially because also these MPAs are, are, some of them have a mandate of also supporting tourism and recreation. Uh, so really what we've been suggesting is to have more public outreach both at marinas um, and at mpa stations so that people are aware um, when they're at their marinas of what might be attached to their boats and how to clean it off um, before they travel and then also that there's awareness when they go into the mpa of uh, the conservation priorities of that area and um, that um, they should be thinking about what they're bringing in so um, that's probably the most feasible uh, management action at this point. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next one's for you, Kim, um, from Christiani. What do you think could be driving the northern extent that you found? What's keeping B. annulata from extending further north? Habitat? But oh, we're not hearing you. It looks like you're uh, self muted.
Okay, Kim. Well, if you wanna, you wanna figure that out, and we can come back. I actually, I just, I can hear now. Perfect. Sorry, what was the question? I didn't hear it. The question was, uh, what do you think could be driving the northern extent that you found? What's keeping B. annulata from extending further north? Habitat? Yeah, you know, when we look at the distribution, we haven't looked at the other variables such as water quality, but instinctively, when you look at the distribution, it's adjacent to shore um, and it's more widely distributed um, in the southern the southern area of the bay, which has more turbidity and most likely nutrients, um, as well as like LBSP. So perhaps the cleaner water is limiting, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, Aaron, we've got a, another one for you. Um, so regarding ED, uh, the eDNA presentation, would you expect to see similar patterns at a smaller spatial scale, i.e. within a state from Natalie Dunn? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, yes. Yes, I would. I mean, I, I think that there's, there, you might, you, we, we found very little um, s biological similarity among the ports. Um, so, so the range of similarity was like point, where dissimilarity was 0. 0.6 to 0. like 0.99. So, um, but most of them are between 0. 0.8 and 0. 0.9. So within a state, you would expect higher similarity, but I would expect the same, about, about the same effect of, of shipping or, or transport and environment um, on on sort of how homogenous any two particular ports were. Um, one thing that we don't include in our model that I, I should say I know is important, it was touched on in several of the presentations is recreational sh uh, vessels because we don't have data at the global scale. So I think a really interesting kind of smaller scale study might merge the the commercial and the recreational shipping data sets together to see if we can get more predictive at the state level. Great, thank you. Um, and just one more for you, Aaron. Uh, any evidence that port clustering follows specific types of trade between groups of ports could be interesting because types of trade could influence the types of vessels involved uh, and could have useful implications for management from Cristiani. Yeah, that's right. We are, um, I think that's in a paper that we wrote and I forget what it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can break things out by ship types and um, uh, with the data set, which is really nice. And so if that's something managers would be more interested in, um, that is something that we can do. I don't think we focused on that yet, but that's a great idea. Um, because yeah, we know that certain ships are uh, more prone or you're more likely to carry ballast or discharge ballast and um, and so that's and for ballast water very important. And then we're we're hoping to extend the model to include also test some biofouling risks. Um, I'm currently working with Chris to try to get better uh, better estimates of that. Um, and that's going to vary by ship type too, because they all have different cleaning schedules, uh, niche areas, things of that nature. Thank you. Um, and I, this is for Kim, I believe. Um, when testing the CaCO2 paste on the introduced uh, anemone, was there any effort to remove motile native organisms? Did you estimate the non-target impacts to motile and non-motile native organisms? No, I think for it to be scalable, um, you have to understand that it's going to be a scorched earth policy, which is why these technologies are more well suited for high impact areas that you need to get rid of the organism. Um, we multile, Some multile organisms were able to leave the area, um, but we didn't quantify that, no. Okay, thank you. Um, so this question is for both Aaron and Amanda uh, from Christiani. 
Any interest in including the Alaska ports that Amanda talked about in Aaron's port metabarcoding work to go along with the vessel traffic data? Uh, how do you each link your programs, each think your programs can benefit from expanding Aaron's work into Alaska? You go first, Amanda. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah, I think I, I'd, I'd love that. Uh, I think that would be really interesting to see um, to see that deployed. I'm not sure if there's been any eDNA, or, like I've heard about it, but I don't know if there's any that are currently going on in the in the Bering Sea. I've been a little out of the loop since tying up this project, unfortunately, um, but I think that would be great. And if there's a way that it could uh, it could it could be done and um, kind of taking advantage of the of, of the infrastructure that's already in place um, then I wonder if we'd be finding things that we didn't know um, were there yeah I'll touch base with you and um, also anybody else who might want to expand their monitoring to include eDNA because um, that's something that I'm going to be trying to do it do at my new position at Maine um, because I'm going to have an eDNA lab, so I'll be able to process samples a lot more quickly than we were able to before. Um, I've also collaborated with Kim Halland, Halland from um, Fisheries Ocean Canada to do some sampling in Arctic Canada up in Churchill, um, some of the emerging ports there, and um, we're finding that it, it works quite well, and they even train the uh, native communities to do the eDNA sampling while they're not there. Um, so it's something that's a really nice, um, big potential for citizen science that can also provide useful data. So let's definitely touch base. Um, and, and also, um, I'm going to try to make the happy hour and the coffee talk if other people want to try to hatch a plan to get this all funded. Awesome. And we've got uh, one question for all the speakers, and I guess we can just go in the order that that you all presented. Um, do you think COVID-19 impacts to human behavior has affected the scenarios of your research or not? Uh, yes, for me, definitely. I mean, um, um, just in terms of shipping, we're currently exploring the impacts on, on shipping because obviously um, some things have slowed down, but some haven't. Um, also things like cruise ships have completely disappeared. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at those scenarios for sure. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I was actually just thinking about that earlier today because I read something about how Trident Seafoods has kind of restricted people going back and forth from Akitan to Dutch Harbor. So they employ about uh, over a thousand seasonal employees and because those places are only 30 miles away, there's a lot of connection between people going back and forth um, and, and obviously in, you know, respecting the impacts and, and the spread on communities, they didn't want their seasonal workers to just be hopping um, to Dutch or to, to Accutan. So I, I suspect that as a result of that, maybe the, the local traffic uh, will be, will the local traffic patterns will have changed. Um, but I think in terms of uh, fisheries, which is probably the main type of traffic that goes on, um, at least along the uh, Dutch Harbor and those ports that we were talking about, I think that that would probably be um, business as usual and not too many cruise ships uh, or those kinds of tourist um, activities are, are taking place in, uh, in the Bering Sea. Um, for my work, I would say uh, anecdotally, uh, it sounds like recreational vessel traffic has increased during COVID because um, that's a great uh, social distancing activity. Um, I am planning on uh, obtaining vessel tracking data for 2020 uh, when the year is over, so I'll be really interested to see um, how patterns have shifted. Um, in terms of conservation uh, and MPAs, um, outreach efforts have been delayed um, from multiple multiple angles. So also just um, letting people know about um, 
fishing regulations within MPAs and, and other stressors um, that we're trying to manage um, the uh, outreach tactics that we were relying on have not been effective during COVID. Um, and then further to that, uh, there's a lot of work being done on how COVID is affecting MPAs in general. And so tourism, of course, is declining. And then also our funding uh, for managing these areas is expected to be a lot more limited. So, yeah. So for the biannual letter control, I guess um, the technologies have been shipped to Palmyra, but depending on what agency you are in, diving is suspended for most agencies. Um, so that project has halted on uh, the USGS, US Fish and Wildlife, and TNC end in Palmyra. Um, I agree with uh, Josephine. Anecdotally, recreational boating has increased as well as fishing. So that could serve as uh, increased vector uh, just locally of invasive species, especially invasive algae. Um, and as far as our management, uh, the main thing that my team works on for management is outplanting of native sea urchins for herbivore pressure on invasive algae. And um, luckily we have been able to write out um, standard operating procedures to allow us to continue with that, but on a smaller scale. Awesome, thank you. And uh, just one more question for you, Kim. Um, do you use your surfboard for field work? No, but we do. Um, we do use boogie boards <laughs> to, to flood out our urchin trays. Yeah. Great. <laughs> thank you, Professor Christine Moffat. Um, okay, well, that about wraps it up. That uh, wraps up the Q&A. Um, so thank all of you. Uh, I just wanted to take a, a few minutes here to um, do a couple announcements and just ask everybody to uh, join the WRP 2020 uh, virtual meeting uh, Facebook page. We'll be doing a happy hour tomorrow at 5 p.m. as well as a coffee chat Thursday at 9 a.m. And uh, we have uh, a chance to enter a drawing from Astonish for a $100 Amazon e-card. You just have to fill out a, a quick survey and that, that'll be posted up onto the uh, 2020 virtual meeting page, uh, both Facebook and the website. So check that out. And uh, with that, uh, I will pass it over to you, Chris, for any closing statements. And thank you all again. Um, yeah, just to uh, echo what Mason said, and I really want to thank everyone for joining us. We had looks like 72 people online today watching the presentations, and thank you to all four of the speakers. Um, great, great work, and sounds like a lot of um, collaboration potential in the future. And um, yeah, it, everything worked out well. So um, we'll just say for tomorrow, day three, we'll be focused on aquatic invasive plants. Same time different link but if you are interested you would have gotten a link or you can register for that link um, and tomorrow's session will be moderated by Mark Volkoff um, so tune in and yeah thanks again everyone thanks Chris nice meeting Thank everybody you. bye bye